This video is about fantasy literature and we will be tackling a rather big question today and the question is what is fantasy literature anyway? Now I'm writing my PhD about fantasy literature so I've spent a considerable amount of time reading fantasy and reading about fantasy and asking myself exactly these questions devoting a lot of thoughts, a lot of time to that in particular and so you might think that I have now become an expert in the field and can present you with my rock solid definition of what fantasy actually is. Well, here's my take on it. It's all a little bit tricky. We will be looking at a number of definitions by various scholars today. For example, uh, we will come across the term blurry sets but also the idea of the land of fairy. And hopefully by the end of this video, you will have a better idea as to what fantasy actually is. Well, since the question is a bit tricky, most scholars of fantasy have had to come up with a definition of their own, tweaking existing ones here and there, establishing new angles with which to approach the genre, mixing various definitions and so on. Um, at the very least, a scholar of fantasy will have to decide which definition if it exists already, to follow. And that's all perfectly fine, and it's something that I have to do for my PhD as well, and that you will have to do if you're writing a term paper or an essay. It is, however, not particularly useful if you're just starting out and this is your first foray into fantasy literature. So, in order to help you along and give you a little bit of a map of the field, I'll sum up some of the most useful, or at least most well-known, approaches that I've encountered so far. Um, please be aware though that there may be others which you will end up preferring and it's up to you to research further into the field uh, to find if that's where your interest lies. Hopefully though my little summary will give you a clear idea of what fantasy literature is about and who the main big scholars in the genre are at the moment. A good starting point might be Zvetan Todorov. He has, after all, written an entire book called The Fantastic. Now, that has to be useful. Well, yes and no. Let's have a look at his definition of the fantastic first. And for that, you can have a look at the quote on the screen. But you can also have a look at secondary literature and read Svetan Todorov's text itself. Now, Todorov talks about the heart of the fantastic being a world which is indeed our world, the one we know, a world without devils, vampires, so on. And in this world, there occurs an event which cannot be explained by the rules of that world. And the person who experiences the event must now opt for one of two possible solutions. Either he's the victim of an illusion of the senses, of a product of the imagination, um, and laws of the world then remain what they are, or else the event has taken place. It is a part of reality, but that means that the, the reality is controlled by laws that are so far unknown to us. Now, the fantastic occupies the duration of this uncertainty, this moment before the person experiencing a fantastic event makes the decision. Once a decision is made, once we choose one answer over the other, the fantastic uh, is no longer there and we leave it for the neighbouring genre, either the uncanny or the marvellous. And so the fantastic, Todorov says, is that hesitation experienced by a person who knows only the laws of nature confronting an apparently supernatural event. Huh. Uncertainty. Hesitation. Does that sound like most of the fantasy you know? Probably not entirely. Not always. After all, when we read Harry Potter, there's very little hesitation as to whether J.K. Rowling made it all up or not, unless you secretly believe J.K. Rowling is really Rita Skeeter, exiled from the magical world and now taking revenge on it, but uh, that's probably a different story. There's no hesitation on, part, on the part of the characters either. Harry may at first think that uh, the giant offering him a birthday cake and an invitation to go study magic is just an overly grown lunatic, but as soon as he gets to Diagon Alley, buys his wand and actually enters Hogwarts, there's no doubt anymore uh, whether something fantastic is actually taking place or not. 
And so according to Todorov, at this point, we are no longer within the fantastic. Todorov then talks about something else when he says fantastic than most scholars of fantasy nowadays do. And that's something you need to pay attention to. Scholars of fantasy use the term fantastic quite a lot, and in fact, we do as well, but it's not exactly in the term as Todorov conceived it. So let's have a look at the two bordering genres now. Todorov mentions the uncanny and the marvelous. The uncanny presents seemingly supernatural events that receive a rational explanation at the end of the tale. All supernatural ex appearance is due to the extraordinary, outrageous nature of the events described. So this will not feature too heavily in our course, as we will focus on speculative fiction where supernatural events do take place, but it may appear in Gothic literature as well as in science fiction literature and dystopia if we do not require the explanation to be something that is true in the fictional as well as in the real world. On the other hand, the marvelous presents supernatural events that will eventually have to be accepted as a part of reality while remaining unexplained and unrationalized. You'll find this in some fantasies, though some also attempt a sort of rational explanation, albeit one that is only true within the story world, and in magic realist texts. As we can see then, taking all three subgenres Todorov defines in the fantastic into account leaves us with a broader picture that has a bit more relevance for fantasy literature as we know it. In our quest to define the fantastic, we cannot possibly look at all scholars who have had something to say on it, but we will focus on a couple of highly prominent names, Brian Atterbury, Catherine Hume, and Farrah Mendelssohn. Have I missed someone? Oh yes, there is of course J.R.R. Tolkien, the grandfather of fantasy, if we want to call him that. And you can't really avoid Tolkien if you're talking about fantasy literature. Reading his On Fairy Tales is one of the tasks for this learning unit, so I won't go into much detail here, but I would recommend everyone to read it, even though the task itself is optional. It is a very good text and you might find it helpful. Up on the screen you can now see a quote where Tolkien talks about the definition of a fairy story, what it is or what it should be, and it does not then depend on any definition or historical account of elf or fairy, but upon the nature of fairy, the perilous realm itself, and the air that blows in that country. I will not attempt to define that, nor to describe it directly, Tolkien says. Very useful. It cannot be done. Fairy cannot be caught in a net of words, for it is one of its qualities to be indescribable, though not imperceptible. It has many ingredients, but analysis will not necessarily discover the secret of the whole. For the moment, I will say only this. A fairy story is one which touches on or uses fairy, whatever its own main purpose may be. Satire, adventure, morality, fantasy. Fairy itself may perhaps most nearly be translated by magic, but it is magic of a peculiar mood and power at the furthest pull from the vulgar devices of the laborious scientific magician. So Tolkien is talking here about fairy stories, but we can sort of equate that with fantasy if we want to read on fairy story and use it for our purposes. Uh, it is a very good text. It talks about the various purposes of fantasy, the idea of the eucatastrophe, so the eventual positive outcome. And it also touches upon the idea that a story that is fantasy literature doesn't necessarily have to be untrue. It is perfectly possible to believe in some of the elements of a fantasy and for that text still to be fantasy. Tolkien in On Fairy Stories occasionally refers to the elves or the fairies by saying if we assume that they do not exist, as, as if there's some sort of hesitation about it. And that may become important later on. Let's move on to Atterbury then. He's the scholar that came up with the term fuzzy set, and that's a term that I find particularly useful. Uh, he thinks that we shouldn't think of genres like as territories on a map with definitional limits that are marking them off completely. Rather than 
doing that, we should think of an overriding kinship among fantasy texts. Mm -hmm. So these fuzzy sets, they circle around uh, a certain core that maybe is the most fantastic and everything that goes around it uh, differs from it to, um, to a degree, you know, more or less. Um, in his definition, he assumes the quest fantasy, so Lord of the Rings, as the prime text, but we'll be talking about other subgenres later on. As a quality shared by all fantasy texts, Atterbury suggests a violation of what is considered consensus reality. And here we come to one of the biggest problems that I am facing in my dissertation. Since I write about fantasy not necessarily originating in a Eurocentric tradition, but coming from parts of the world whose consensus reality may not coincide with ours, determining what is and isn't fantasy becomes a lot harder. What do we do with writers like Amberlynn Quimelina, to employ an Australian example, who says, one of the aspects of my own novels that is regularly interpreted as being pure fantasy, that of an ancient creation spirit who sung the world into being, is for me simply part of my reality. While at the same time emphasizing her own affinity for the speculative fiction genre. She states, for example, that many of the ideas which populate speculative fiction, notions of time travel, astral projection, speaking the languages of animals or, tr or trees, are part of indigenous cultures. So Quimelina does consider herself a speculative fiction writer. She does say that she writes about fantastic things, but at the same time she also says that some of the things she writes about, she writes about are seen as fantasy by Western scholars or Western readers, but not by her. Well, I cannot really provide a, a one-size-fits-all solution there. Non-Western speculative fiction fantasy needs to be treated with care. The author's intention as well as the audience's interpretation both have to be taken into account and an actual decision can likely only be made on a case-to-case -case basis. My own research has so far tended towards an attempt to break apart the strict binary opposition between fantasy and reality in the first place. Both terms are more blurry than Western rationalism would have us believe and Following Nedio Korafor's lead, I would agree that fantasy can sometimes be the best way of describing reality. And so if you see fantasy literature like that, the contrast isn't as big. It's not as much of an obstacle. If you look at fantasy and you don't necessarily have to say it's, it's not real. So that, that breaking apart of this, this binary is something that has helped me with my research. Um, you may also want to refer to Catherine Hume for that. In her Fantasy and Mimesis, Responses to Reality in Western Literature, she discusses a wide variety of narrative situations within fantasy and actively considers writers' and readers' interpretations in order to define it. You could even say that in Catherine Hume's scholarship, fantasy is in the eye of the beholder. Some of the quotes that I find most interesting um, talk about how fantasy includes transgressions of what one generally takes to be physical facts, such as human immortality, travel faster than light, telekinesis, telepathy, and so on and so on. So it's, this, it's still taking this digression from consensus reality as a starting point. However, Jung also includes things that may become real at some point in the future, Think teleportation, think mobile phones. I believe Star Trek had those way before we did. Um, and she also considers fantasy those stories whose marvel is considered real, although not in the same fashion that a chair is real. So if we look at texts from different times, different cultures, where something magical happens, something fantastic happens, and this something is still considered to be real. It's something that's been thought to exist by the original audience or even the author, but it's not something that happens every day. And so that can still make it fantasy, even though it may be something that both readers and authors assume is possible. It can still be fantastic in that it is a miracle. It only happens to a select number of people. And so that kind of helps us with 
well, with viewing fantasy in a manner that doesn't oppose it quite as strictly to reality. Hopefully you have now a clear idea of how other scholars approach fantasy literature. If you need to, or if you want to read up on it, I suggest that you start with Brian Atterbury, Lucy Ahmed, Catherine Hume, or Farah Mendelssohn, all of which you'll find in most university libraries, certainly the one that I'm working from, and the Cambridge Companion to Fantasy Literature would likely also be a good idea. So before I continue, I would like to ask you, what is fantasy literature? How would you define it and which texts would you allow into your personal canon? Please do head over to the forum to discuss this question in a group. Now I'm sure you've written a post or two and are ready to talk a little bit about subgenres. We'll start with Farah Mendelssohn, who I've mentioned before. She's the author of Rhetorics of Fantasy, in which she tries to delineate various subgenres of fantasy and their concurrent rhetorics, that is, specific ways of writing and constructing the different forms of fantasy, including content, tropes, and structure. Mendelssohn identifies four clearly distinguishable forms of fantasy. The portal quest, the intrusion fantasy, the immersive fantasy, and the liminal fantasy. I probably don't even need to say very much about the portal quest fantasy. If you have even a passing knowledge of fantasy literature, this will likely be the form most familiar to you. It is defined by a central quest. Think, for example, the destruction of the ring in The Lord of the Rings. And it may contain literal or metaphorical portals. Think of the wardrobe in the Narnia Chronicles, for example. Quest fantasies have their readers transition from a place of comfort towards the wider and often wilder world. They typically assemble a band of companions, the Fellowship, and an older and wiser mentor, and occasionally also love interests with whom they travel through a massive wild landscape of forests, rivers, mountains, valleys, small villages, and occasional cities. If you read fantasy, you will probably notice that landscape often plays quite an important role, nature plays an important role, and so concepts of eco-criticism can be used very productively on fantasy literature. If you want to know more about that, do head over to our bus video on eco-criticism. Often the heroes of our quest fantasy face an existential threat, most often a dark lord, who they must eventually defeat. Now, in an immersive fantasy, the reader is treated as if they were a character with expert knowledge about the story world already. So facets of the world are only implied, and the reader has to piece the world together through subtle hints. An immersive fantasy presents magic and all elements that make it a fantasy as completely accepted and a part of everyday life. Interestingly, according to Mendelssohn, an immersive fantasy does not need that belief in the dividing line between the real and the not real to function, at least not within the narrative itself, which may result in the immersive fantasy genre being particularly attractive to post-colonial writers, whose own epistemologies may draw different lines between reality and fantasy than the Western reader is accustomed to. Then we have the intrusion fantasy. As the name implies, this kind of fantasy deals with stories in which the fantastic enters the normal world. It intrudes upon it. And it destabilizes reality not only for the readers, but also for the characters. The intrusion has to be negotiated with or defeated, sent back whence it came from or controlled. Vampires in Sydney have to be defeated, werewolves in Melbourne kept at bay, and so on. My examples may already have tipped you off. Urban fantasies can be seen as intrusion fantasies in the Mendelssohnian system, and we will likely talk about them in more detail uh, when discussing some of the excerpts that I've prepared to you, or in some versions of this course, even the main primary literature text. Keep in mind for now that an intrusion fantasy often speaks of the permeability of the world and shows a distrust of what is known in favour of what is sensed which enables the protagonist to accept the supernatural intrusions as real, rather than identify them as signs of mental illness, for example. Interestingly, the intrusion fantasy is also a narrative of convincement, and engaged in the making of history. Established history is questioned and destabilized, while alternative versions 
here including fantastical elements, are presented. Mendelssohn states that while the history and reality of the primary world may be challenged, the information on the supernatural never is. Much like in the Portal Quest fantasy, it is sort of downloaded and given to the, the main character from a representative of the intruding world. And eventually it has to be accepted by the protagonists as real, even though they may still be confused with regards to the fantastical events taking place. This confusion allows them to succeed by challenging the rules or changing them, usually in the face of the pessimism of their colleague from the fantastical lands, which both Mendelssohn and fantasy writer Naylor Hopkinson identify as the colonialist fantasy of rescuing the natives from themselves. And this is something that we can see in the Portal Quest fantasy as well, where the character from the primary world one resembling ours enters the secondary world and is immediately seen as the chosen hero. It sort of implies that the natives of the secondary world cannot save themselves. They need this intrusion from the non-magical main character, for example. Lastly, for now, there's the liminal fantasy. That's a very interesting one, but also a very difficult one to grasp. It is that form of fantasy which estranges the reader from the fantastic as seen and described by the protagonist, because reader and protagonist interpret the events differently. This effect can be achieved through various strategies specified by Mendelssohn. For example, readers can be led to feel doubt as to the veracity of the supernatural events through the narration, or they can be made to feel alienated and distanced from the magic because the protagonist's interpretation of fantasy may differ from what the reader uh, regards of, as fantasy and mundane things may be seen as magical or vice versa. There is however not one way to produce the liminal in a liminal fantasy and thus the category is, as Mandelson admits, most susceptible and perhaps most in need of Atterbury's argument for the fuzzy set. And this is why Mendelssohn relies most heavily on examples by defining the liminal fantasy and explains various strategies to create liminality and latency via the narratives that employ them. Doubt can play an even more crucial role in the construction of a liminal fantasy. And some forms of this subgenre, as defined by Mendelssohn, depend heavily on the uncertainty whether magic is real or not, whether the roots of the fantastic events in a novel lie elsewhere, for example. And as such, it is perhaps the closest to Todorov's conception of the fantastic, which depends, after all, on this moment of hesitation. And the moment of indecision between various potential explanations for seemingly supernatural occurrences. The reader may wonder whether anything magical has actually taken place, and if so, where the magic is positioned. Just remember, the character may look at something mundane, a cheese sandwich, and regard it as magical, be amazed by how fantastic it really is, whereas there's a unicorn galloping by in the background, meanwhile confusing the reader, but seen as something completely mundane uh, by the protagonist, by the characters. Multiple readings can coexist in the in liminal fantasy, and they allow for ambiguous texts in which fantasy might take place or it might not. And the fantastic may be real or it may be illusion or hallucination. There are, of course, also other ways of subdividing this fantasy genre. You've now heard the four concepts that Mendelssohn came up with, which I find quite useful because of the rhetorics that she identified, so the certain tropes and structures that define these subcategories. But there's a number of other ways of looking at fantasy and saying, hey, this is a subgenre, this is a specific genre that has a certain set of rules within fantasy. And some of those are historical fantasy, urban fantasy, dark fantasy and paranormal romance, fantasy detective stories. You may know Ben Aronovich's Rivers of London series. That's a good example. There's also children's fantasy and there's much more than that. They can be useful in your research or they can hinder you since genre is a fluid concept and I think that's something that you learn throughout this course. It's fuzzy and it's not at all easy to delineate. You have to decide for yourself whether it makes sense to class certain fantasies together and others not. 
and your decision may decide on a case-by-case -case basis. Personally, I find Mendelssohn's Rhetorics of Fantasy helpful, and you may want to check her book out in the library, especially as some of these fantasies may come up with the primary text that we'll be looking at for this course. So that's it for now. In the next video, we'll be looking at Australian fantasy in particular, before then moving on to the third video where I'll be talking, or somebody else will be talking about the primary literature example for this session.